Tommy Kissinger with Tommy's Truth Talk. Thank you so very much for joining us again. This is going to be What is Salvation? Part 3. We're really asking and answering that very question. What is salvation? When we say, I'm saved, or I'm being saved, or I'm going to be saved, or are you saved? When we ask someone else that question. What is it we're saying? What is it we're asking? What are we being saved from? What is salvation? So we've been reading from the writings of Dr. Stephen Jones, his series entitled Key Biblical Concepts. It's just phenomenal. Thank you, Doc Jones. We're going to pick up where we left off. But before we do that, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, smash that thumbs up button. If you like all things God related and that he sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world. And of course, on this channel, we specialize in covering the topic, the ultimate restoration of all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and if you have not subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. We want to have you to be a part of this grand and glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So last time we finished by talking about justification by faith, and we're going to pick up now with talking about sanctification, the second part of our salvation journey or process. Sanctification is our journey from Egypt to the promised land. In this second stage, we die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. It is not enough to reckon ourselves dead through our Passover experience of justification. We must continually die because the old man is not really dead. I'm sorry, the old man is not really so dead after all. We die daily during our entire sanctification experience in the wilderness journey. This is the second phase of salvation or deliverance from sin and death. So we see that the things that happened to Israel of old in the Old Testament were really examples for us and our salvation. They were brought out of Egypt. Well, we need to be brought out of Egypt by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. They were brought through the wilderness, given the law, and really brought through a time of sanctification. And we need to appear before the Lord in that second phase of our salvation where God's law is written on our hearts. We're given the Holy Spirit and we go through the wilderness and we're tried by fire and we are tested. The final phase of salvation is the glorification of the body, which occurs in a moment of time as we enter the promised land. Glorification is what we are being saved into. Let me say that again. Glorification is what we are being saved into. It is the inheritance that God has promised to us. It is not heaven per se, but it is a heavenly condition where heaven comes to earth and is fully manifested in our body. When we are fully like Jesus, having a glorified body like he had after his resurrection, then we can say that we are truly saved in full, having been delivered from sin and death. Once again, Israel comes out of Egypt, goes through the promise, I'm sorry, goes through the wilderness and into the promised land. Let's say it again. Israel comes out of Egypt, they go through the wilderness and into the promised land. So we must also go through this also in our salvation experience. We must be justified, we must be sanctified, and ultimately we must be glorified. The promised land really represents the inheritance of our glorified bodies. For some it will be at the first resurrection for others, probably most, it will be at the second general resurrection. Now, Doc Jones gets on into this section entitled the two covenants. The promised land given to the Israelites was the land of Canaan. But this was only a type and shadow of a greater inheritance that God intended to give. Israel's entry into Canaan did not deliver them from sin as biblical history shows. 
A land inheritance is good, but unless we inherit our own land, our body that is made of the dust of the ground, Genesis 2, 7, we will fall far short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. We must never think that real estate represents the inheritance of salvation that God promised to those who believe in him. At best, it can only represent a step toward full salvation. It can only be a dim picture, a type and shadow of better promises, Hebrews 8, 6, that are yet to come. The book of Hebrews ties these better promises to the better covenant in the same verse. This refers to the new covenant that is better than the old covenant under Moses. The old covenant was based on the promises of men to God who vowed in Exodus 19:8. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. The new covenant is based on the promises of God to men in Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is phenomenal, ladies and gentlemen, when we understand the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And it's summed up right here where it says the old covenant was based on the promises of men to God. God says, do this, don't do that. And then a man says, well, God, I promise to keep your laws. Well, we all fail. Man could not keep the law in its fullness we break God's law, we sin, we fail all the time. So the old covenant was really to show us that we needed the new covenant, that we couldn't do it in and of ourselves in the flesh. Flesh, humanity, cannot inherit the promises of God. So what does God do? He says, well, I'm bringing this new covenant or this better covenant, okay? And so the new covenant is based on the promises of God to men. Now we got something. Now we're talking about something that cannot fail, that will not fail, that's not based upon flesh, but is based upon spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God. God is not a man that he should lie. So that means this new covenant cannot fail, will not fail. It shall come to pass. What will, what's going to come to pass? Well, this is what's going to come to pass. God is going to put his laws in our minds. God is going to write his laws on our hearts. He's going to be our God. We're going to be our people. I'm sorry. We're going to be his people. Period. You got that? He's going to be our God. We are going to be his people. Period. It's going to happen. Nothing can stop it from all men coming to know the Lord because it is going to be and is based off of the new covenant, God's promises to men. The new covenant is a one-sided promise of God. The old covenant said, if you will indeed obey. The new covenant said, I will and they shall be. Whereas the people found it impossible to fulfill their vow to God, God is able all right, now let's drive this home, baby. God is able to fulfill his vow to us. This is not merely a vow to make salvation available to all, but a promise to save all in the end. Do you got it? That's what the new covenant is all about. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw or drag all men to myself. This is not merely a vow to make salvation available to all, but a promise to save all in the end. This is the revelation and full understanding of the new covenant, that God has the power, love, and the wisdom to save all, to write his laws upon every mind and every heart. We will keep them. He will be our God, and we shall be his people. It cannot be stopped. God has sworn and the word has gone out of his mouth 
and it will not come back void, but it shall accomplish what he has sent it out to do. He sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He came to seek and save that which was lost, and he shall do it. It's based off of his promises to men. It's called the New Covenant.